Our next panel, the Honorable Deval Patrick is Governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Governor Patrick's career includes leadership experience at the top levels of business, nonprofits, and government, including as Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights at the Justice Department. Governor, Governor Patrick recently signed into law legislation to maximize the Commonwealth's eligibility to receive Recovery Act funding. The new law builds on the work and ideas of hundreds of people who participated in task force to help establish a plan for the best use of federal stimulus dollars. Governor, will you stand? Let me swear you in. You agree to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. If so, answer in the affirmative. Yes. Let the record reflect that he answered in the affirmative. You may Thank be seated. You. Governor, uh, we will allow you uh, 10 minutes. You know, you after all, you're governor. <laughs> and, uh, you, you get 10 minutes, so uh, you, you can proceed. <laughs> well, Mr. Chairman, thank you, I think, um, for, the, uh, for the 10 minutes. I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be brief, uh, and I want to apologize in advance that I have to leave early for an appointment um, uh, elsewhere in the city. For, uh, but my staff and I would be happy to follow up with you and Congressman Issa and the members of the uh, committee, our own uh, uh, members of the Massachusetts delegation and others and their staff on any specific questions you right. may have. Respect, we respect your time constraints. Thank you very much, thank Mr. You. Chairman. And thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act and its impact on the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I want to ask that you accept my written statement uh, uh, for the record and permit me to just summarize it. Right. Um, Without objections. Minutes. Thank you. First, I want to acknowledge and thank the Congress and the President uh, for providing these much needed resources. These are the tools that we need to help us weather these unprecedented economic times and to begin to transition our economy over time to the next chapter of sustained growth. So far, Massachusetts has received close to $2.6 billion in federal recovery funds. Most, I think like most states, has come uh, for Medicaid and education. Some as the first installment on transportation projects. While we've not been able to avoid all layoffs and cuts in state services, without ARA funds, these cuts would have been much more drastic and disruptive. With them, Massachusetts has been able to sustain critical safety net programs and services, such as in education and health care. And I just want to get into that a little bit more. Uh, in education, Recovery Act funds enabled us to maintain our investments in education reform a 15-year commitment that has placed our students first in the nation on the NAEPS scores and in the top six in the world on the TIMS measure of science and math. The recovery funds have also enabled us to continue our pioneering experiment in health care reform, where over 97 percent of our residents are insured today, the highest level in the nation. In uh, FY 2010, the increased FMAP will allow us to maintain eligibility and benefits for hundreds of thousands of low-income residents who rely on state-subsidized health insurance. We estimate that the Recovery Act's education and FMAP funding have helped us retain thousands of teachers, social workers, health care workers, and others. Our initial highway funds are putting people back to work today and laying the foundation for future growth. We're using highway stimulus funds in Fall River, an area especially hard hit by the recession, for a new interchange opening up 300 acres of property for commercial and industrial development. Investments are also being made in the western part of the state for an intermodal facility to allow for the more efficient interaction of different transportation methods. We are ready to put forthcoming Recovery Act funding and our people to work, especially in the innovation economy. The clean energy field is the fastest growing sector in the state with 20 percent growth in 2007. Today we have more than 500 firms and 14,000 people working in, those, in that field. With a program I announced just last week to use Recovery Act funds to install solar panels on state buildings, including all four terminals at Logan Airport, those numbers will grow. Town halls, libraries, and other municipal buildings are also set to receive funds for solar installations and homeowners for weatherization. And small businesses are likely to undertake the majority of this work, which I think is very good news for that important sector of our economy. Our plans are ready to implement for investments in transportation projects, 
labor and workforce development programs, and new technology, including broadband expansion, to unserved and underserved communities. These federal investments, coupled with state bonding resources we have committed, will create jobs today and improve our infrastructure for tomorrow. Just want to point out, 4,900 jobs were created in the Massachusetts economy in May, the first new jobs created uh, in a year in the Commonwealth. And while not all of those can necessarily be uh, attributed to uh, the Recovery Act, I can tell you that certainly they helped. It's way too soon, in my view, to unfurl the mission accomplished banner, but we're on the right track. The Recovery Act has provided an opportunity to make fundamental changes to the way we do business. For instance, the use it or lose it requirements helped in, help motivate us to examine and improve the process for contract awards. As a result, the time for bid from bid opening to notice to proceed has been cut from 120 days to less than 60 days without any loss of oversight. And the members of the Massachusetts delegation will know that this has been a particular challenge of ours in Massachusetts over the years and a real focus of our administration. In the same vein, I commend the Congress for insisting that we deliver on the goal of maximum transparency and accountability. In Massachusetts, we have been focused on creating a transparent, accessible way for both professional watchdogs and average citizens to track recovery spending, and we have taken a number of steps to protect against waste, fraud, and abuse. First, even before the Recovery Act's enactment, we identified the state agencies and programs through which recovery funds were likely to flow and directed those agencies to review, update, and amend their existing internal controls to, plan, uh, to satisfy the most rigorous compliance oversight requirements. We then vetted those control plans with the state auditor, inspector general, and attorney general, all independent officials in Massachusetts, to see if they saw any gaps that we had missed. Second, we established a centralized Recovery Act project management office. We call it the Office of Infrastructure Investment. This office coordinates projects between state agencies and municipalities, helping to streamline the process of obtaining regulatory approvals and ensuring compliance with federal and state regulations. The office will include a compliance and monitoring manager who will oversee internal control processes, assess compliance risks, and conduct periodic compliance reviews across all state agencies receiving these funds. And third, we've developed a state website, a recovery website, mass.gov slash recovery, on which we publish Recovery Act spending by type and by region for money that th flows through the state. The site will contain all the information required by the Act, including a detailed description of each Recovery Act funded project and activity. And finally, I want to mention two items that need, I believe, the continuing attention and partnership of the Congress, the administration, and the states. Number one, we are still waiting for the bulk of the money. I understand that much of the funds will be released this summer, and that's very good. But I would be remiss if I didn't make the point that we as governors are ready to go and want to work with our federal partners to ensure projects start quickly. We can do this, I believe, without sacrificing the important goals of transparency and effective oversight. Both goals are possible and both must be achieved simultaneously. But no funds, no projects, and no projects, no jobs. So with due respect, passing the bill, as important as that was, creates no jobs. Spending the money creates the jobs. Number two. Although I commend Congress for authorizing states to utilize a small portion of Recovery Act funds for central reporting and accountability systems, the process that states have to go through to obtain authorization to begin spending these funds needs to be simplified. States have been instructed that in order to, to access Recovery Act funds to pay for centralized systems, including that transparency and accountability that I referred to, states must follow longstanding cost allocation procedures set forth in an OMB administrative circular, number 87, and then submit proposed amendments to their existing statewide cost allocation plans to Health and Human Services for re review and approval. Now, we are currently in negotiations with HHS over the details of our proposed plan because we have concerns about whether those procedures adequately account for the Recovery, Act, Recovery Act's unique issues and requirements. 
In the meantime, however, we can't access the funds until the, uh, um, uh, uh, we finish those negotiations, and it's unclear when those negotiations will conclude. And I, to the best of my no knowledge, there is uh, no other state that's in a different position. Everybody is stuck on this particular point right now. Now, our controller has shared these concerns with OMB. The issues are complicated. We have a very productive working relationship and discussion with, uh, with OMB, but we need to conclude this as promptly as possible in order to allow the time to build those accountability and transparency systems uh, to track uh, Recovery Act spend. So again, I just want to thank you for inviting me today. I thank you for the initial investment in the long-term effort to help America recover from this economic crisis, and I am happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, um, you, uh, Governor. Chairman. And let me just inform the members that um, we have two other governors that will be joining us, and we just swear them in at that time. And this, I would like to yield five minutes from the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch. Uh, Thank you, Mr. No, I'm sorry, Mr. Lynch. And the reason for it is that he yielded his time. Mr. Lynch. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Governor, I, I appreciate you, you coming here and helping the committee with its work. Um, I do have a copy of, uh, of Gene Dodaro's, uh, well, the um, report on the Recovery Act uh, funding uh, and the results that his uh, periodic review has uh, uh, done in Massachusetts. And, and I would say that at least according to this report, uh, you got pretty strong marks. Uh, there are some questions, but for that which he could determine, uh, Mr. Dodaro has, uh, I, I think, expressed some confidence in the way that you're handling in Massachusetts, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, I do want to say that originally the Recovery Act was all about creating jobs, and, uh, and that's how it was announced to the public, and, and, uh, and that's how its success or lack of success is being measured, and I think that's fair. Uh, when you think about the, the uh, difficulties we're having, the focus on job creation was the simplest way, I think, to address that, that crisis. But through the legislative process, it became more than a jobs creation bill. Mm. It became a, a massive uh, health care uh, uh, supplemental mm -hmm. and education supplemental, mm -hmm. which were desperately needed in Massachusetts and around the country, but not necessarily job creation measures. Desperately needed, but the money that we spent on education, the money we spent on health care, wasn't necessarily uh, resulting in the creation of jobs. And I think some people uh, forget that fact. The, the, the other piece that, that I think has confounded us all is the fact that it has taken so long for some of this money to get out on the street, get out on the job sites, create those, those transportation jobs that we were hoping for. And uh, I want to ask you, uh, it seems to me, in reading the report uh, by Mr. Dodaro and uh, the Government Accountability Office, that there was a pipeline for the health care money to get out there. It was all set up. There's a pipeline for the education money to get out there. There are systems in place to spend that money. But in one-of-a-kind projects, transportation projects, uh, infrastructure projects, there was not a... a, a these were one-of-a-kind projects. They were um, basically established by the governors in term, terms of priorities. So there's been a delay in getting, look, I'm a, I'm a former iron worker. Nothing makes me happier than when I see the iron workers and the building trades people go to work. Right. Uh, and, and I just want to ask you about the difficulty that we're seeing that you expressed in your own comments mm -hmm. about getting that money out on, the, out on the job sites and creating these jobs. Uh, what do you think is, is where do you think is, is the holdup? What is the, the, the key component here that we're missing in, uh, in, in seeing this, uh, this very long delay uh, in, in getting that money out to create the jobs? Congressman, thank you for your comments and questions. And let me, let me respond to both of them. First, the, the job creation versus job retention, both are important because if the, uh, and to your point, I agree with you, the bill is trying to accomplish more than one thing, um, and that those difference uh, or did added uh, goals were developed in the course of the legislative process, and we res not only respect, but we appreciate that. Because frankly, if we are unable to maintain 
services, um, particularly those where the demand goes up because the economy is in stress, uh, then that compounds uh, some of the economic uh, 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 stresses uh, that we are dealing with in my state and, and, uh, and in others. So, I, others. so I think the job retention counts and being able to maintain our investments in education and health care are enormously uh, important. In terms of the length of time of moving the money out, and again, I make the point and I have made it privately to, uh, to agencies as well, no, no, no funds, no projects, no projects, no jobs. That's where the job creation uh, comes from. I think that everyone is trying to balance another objective of the, uh, uh, of the act and of good policy making, which is utterly thorough oversight and to make sure that we, because, because I think there is a, a sensitivity that a misstep um, could rightly or wrongly discredit the whole program. And so in many, in the cases you talked about, um, we're having to, the agencies are having to create new guidelines, new frameworks for moving the, um, the money out. They have been very open to consultation from governors and others about what those guidelines ought to be. But until those are in place, um, we are told the money won't uh, uh, flow. Most of them are in place at this point, and so I think the summer is when we'll see a lot of those uh, funds coming our way. Could I jump no, in no, on that? Uh, no, please do, uh, Governor. No, no, Thank no, you. Governor, we, we didn't swear you in yet, so we're gonna have to, you're going to have to hold it for a second. I promise I'll tell the truth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have to hold it for a second. I tell you, let, let, let me swear you in. If you stand now, okay. we can swear both of you in. We swear both of you Governor in. Governor O'Malley hasn't been sworn. Yeah, but... You agree to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, if so, answer in the affirmative. I do. I do. Right. You may be seated. Now you can participate. I think the point that Governor Patrick made is, is a very good one. And I think the administration worries about it, and we do too. I mean, I have personally said that I am going to oversee every dime of the stimulus money for my last 18 months in office because I want it to go well. And I see, and I don't mean yourself, because you're certainly not alone, but I read in the newspapers, Politico today, stimulus money getting out too slow, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If this money had been thrown out the door without proper planning, if this money had been rushed out on the streets, a, a, a compacted RFP pro, uh, process so that really the governors could pick who the contractors were, et cetera, well, there would be hell to pay, because there were two things that all of us worried about, and I think the administration did too, getting it done fast, but getting it done right. And I think the administration has struck the proper balance, and I think we have. I saw Mr. Marino's answer, I, th I don't know if it was Congressman Ice's question, but where he said, look, where there were existing streams, like the transportation money, transportation money we just handle like any federal funds, the money f flowed to the uh, regional planning organizations by formula. They made the decisions on projects, gave them back to PennDOT. Where that would, on more than half of our 242 transportation projects, we have a billion plus in, in transportation dollars. That's incredible to do it in less than four months. It's, the transportation uh, plan was approved March 12th. It's less than four months. That's an incredible record of, of success. But, but for other things like uh, uh, the energy Clean program mm -hmm. or, or things like that, right. The federal government's developing their own guidelines, and, and, and they shouldn't rush. In fact, if you looked at my testimony as chairman of the NGA, one of the things the NGA asked for is a little bit more time, not to be quite so rushed, so we can have a little bit more time in the planning process. Because it's our rear ends on the, on the line. If, if something in Pennsylvania or Maryland or Massachusetts gets screwed up, there's waste or fraud or, uh, or the money goes to projects that aren't worthwhile, we're going to get it before the administration. I think they've struck the proper balance. If you're frustrated, so am I. I, I believe that this program will, in fact, have a significant effect in not only job retention, but in job creation. But remember, it's just barely July. July, August, September, October. You will see unbelievable amounts of people coming back to work on the infrastructure uh, portions of this and orders going into factories all over the, the, the country. So I think we tried, and the administration did, to, to do the two things. Get it, do it fast, but do it right. The gentleman's time has Thank expired. You. I, Thank, I you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry if I took <laughs> Thank, Thank, Thank you. Governor Patrick, I appreciate your being here, and I understand you have to leave Thank very you, shortly, so I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, 
this may not come as a, a surprise to you at all, but I have a concern uh, specifically on, in your state. Uh, and correct me if anything in the Boston Globe is wrong. Uh, <laughs> there isn't time. I, I, do it with, I, do it, I do it with the LA Times whenever I can, too. But uh, the federal prevailing wage uh, is 37.45. Mm -hmm. uh, it was reported in a couple sources here, but I have uh, the prevailing wage, if you will, the actual market rate wage in uh, your state in the Boston area is 27.09. So prevailing, federal prevailing wage is higher than the actual prevailing wage of sort of everybody, and that's not uncommon. But Massachusetts has chosen a prevailing wage of 58.84, and it's been reported by the Boston, po Boston Globe and others that this represents, depending upon which figure you look at, $141 million to, uh, uh, I have figures up in the $174 million range, but just using the globe, $141 million of wasted money. Now, can you explain to us why you would pay higher than the federal prevailing wage if the money was delivered to you by the federal government in order to maximize the, if you will, gain in jobs mm -hmm. or the, minimize the loss of jobs at the earlier testimony the 141 million would be at least 1,500 jobs mm -hmm. that would have been saved had you used the federal prevailing wage, uh, and of course even more had market forces allowed for, if you will, in a tough time, the lowest wage, the highest return to Massachusetts, right. and of course uh, the greatest amount of people not laid off. Congressman, thank you for the for the question. If you give me the uh site of whatever article it is you were uh, uh, referring to, I'd be happy to check on and follow up. I think you know that we have different prevailing wages for different, um, for different uh, uh, trades right. uh, and, different, uh, and different jobs. And as you said, the average prevailing wage is, is lower than the uh, federal average uh, um, prevailing wage. But I'd be happy to check on, the, on those facts. 141 million total was from the Beacon Hill Institutes. Uh, and, and like I say, we'll give you a copy of this. Okay. But uh, this goes to, you know, this, the Congress passed this with a, Dakin, a Davis Bacon provision. So there's no question that you were required to use a federal prevailing wage. You mm -hmm. were not allowed to use, if you will, what I might have considered, which was get the maximum amount of people working. Mm -hmm. My grandfather worked in WPA, and trust me, that was not a federal prevailing wage as, as we understand mm -hmm. it today. Mm -hmm. They were paid very little, but they were paid every day. Mm -hmm. and, and it really made a difference in, in knocking down unemployment. Right. And in a great, to a certain extent, this is fashioned after WPA. We're asking you to find projects, in this case, shovel ready, mm -hmm. but find projects, get them out, get a maximum amount of people. You've been to a certain extent, incentivized to do it based on number of jobs, not right. necessarily dollars spent. That's right. That's right. So wouldn't it be, as governor, as chief executive, uh, wouldn't it be reasonable for you to have tried to maximize the number of jobs it created rather than the maximum dollars to those who were fortunate enough to get those jobs? Well, Congressman, I appreciate the, I appreciate the question, but in my original line of work as a lawyer, that would be called a question that presumes a fact, not an evidence. You've told me what you've read in the newspaper. I don't know. I haven't seen this article. I don't. I would not. Uh, I, I, so you know, I understand the Boston Globe is not as widely read. Well, I'm not, it's, not, it's, it's not a dig at the Globe. It's just uh, I don't know what you're referring to. I do know that um, uh, we have, in the view of our own oversight and the Inspector General's uh, uh, oversight, complied fully with the, uh, uh, with the expectations. Well, yeah, there's, no, the there's no prohibition paying more than Davis Bacon. Mm -hmm. I understand that you had, as chief executive, would you say, and this is, this is not based on facts, not in evidence, mm -hmm. but would you say that your obligation is to get the maximum work done, the maximum number of employment, and therefore the least expensive cost of each production? Meaning, if you will, if you can pay less or mandate a lower figure than you currently might mandate for a particular job, right. wouldn't it be consistent with the intent of Congress and with the best interest of the people of your state that you, in fact, do that? Well, not only would it be consistent, but I think it's what we do. We have, uh, we have our own 
uh, state laws that require an open uh, and transparent bidding process and that, uh, and that decisions be made based on the uh, most effective and least, uh, least expensive. Okay, and, and I thank you, and, and we'll, we'll provide you a copy of this, and perhaps That'd you be can great. give us a response be happy to, come to anything back to on you. that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Go Governor um, Patrick, thank you so much for your participation. Thank you very much for and your According to the agreement, it's now 102, and I'm two minutes behind my schedule with you. Thank, <laughs> thank you, you so much for coming. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. At this time, I would like to yield uh, to Congressman Van Hollen to introduce the uh, Governor of Maryland. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all the Governors uh, here, but a special greeting uh, to our Governor uh, from the great state of Maryland, uh, Governor Martin O'Malley. We have two other Marylanders on this committee. Uh, this has been schedules, as you know, got uh, mixed, moved around, but uh, on behalf of Elijah Cummings and John Sarbanes as well, you and just, Mr. Chairman, to say that uh, we are very proud of the fact that our Governor uh, was ready to go. Uh, as soon as the economic recovery uh, money hit the street. Uh, I know a number of states have vied for this uh, 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 position, but I think the record will show that uh, we, when it came to transportation money, had the first project uh, to hit the street shovel ready, and he's combined that with an accountability system that he's carried over from his days uh, as mayor of Baltimore and now as governor uh, that has made sure that this must spend in our state of Maryland. So I want to thank you for having this hearing and thank uh, Governor O'Malley for being here. Congressman, thank you very much for your introduction. Thank Mr. Chairman, thank you. Chairman Towns, thank you. Ranking Member Issa, members of the committee, it's an honor to be here with, with all of you today. And Mr. Chairman, I'm encouraged and congratulate you on the passage in the House, anyway, of your legislation on the Enhanced Oversight of State and Local Economic Recovery Act, which provides some additional guidance and some greater flexibility and clarity for us at the state. And, and again, I want to thank Congressman uh, Chris Van Hollen for his leadership on these issues. We were together when we were breaking ground on some of these recovery projects in Montgomery County, and also Congressman Elijah Cummings, who was here earlier, and Congressman John Sarbanes. For those of us working for our citizens in state government, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act has really been a lifeline. Uh, it is helping us to create and save jobs in Maryland. It is allowing us to position our state's economy to bounce back from this recession. And in these tough times, it's helping us to protect some of our most important priorities, namely the health of our people and the education of our children. In Maryland, we share President Obama's commitment to investing our Recovery and Reinvestment Act funds with maximum efficiency, maximum openness, maximum transparency. And to guide us in this process, we're using an initiative and a system of management that we call StateStat. StateStat was born out of CityStat, which in turn was born out of ComStat, the system that the NYPD used to dramatically reduce crime in New York City. Its first tenant of all of those stats is timely, accurate information shared by all. Timely, accurate information shared by all. We took city stat to, with us to state government in 2007 so that when the recovery and reinvestment dollars uh, were uh, appropriated uh, and passed, we already had a tracking system in place. And we used state stat and our first in the nation IMAP, which, by the way, was uh, developed uh, in cooperation with ESRI, I believe a San Diego-based company that's terrific on GIS, to strategically target our Recovery and Reinvestment Act investments. We routinely and relentlessly meet with key agency officials. We collect and analyze benchmark data in order to change tactics and strategies where necessary to achieve our goals. We use GIS technology to map and track our progress, connecting these important dollars not only to the programs from which they're coming, but to the places, the towns, the municipalities, the counties, the neighborhoods to which they're going, making real differences in the lives of real people. And again, we've made the data available on our website for all of our citizens to see. I'm going to run through a few brief slides here as, uh, uh, as I wrap up. This is our state stat website. If we click here on this recovery tab, we call up a special page dedicated to the Recovery and Reinvestment Act. We tried to make sure that stylistically design-wise this flowed from uh, the federal site. If you look on the left, we have tabs which lead to two GIS maps which are part of our IMAP. One is an overview, the other is more detailed. Here on the overview map, we display the overall statewide breakdown of Recovery and Reinvestment Act funding areas. We also allow citizens to click on their own county to retrieve local information. For example, if we click on Prince George's County, you can see the county is receiving $319.9 million in stimulus funds. And again, you see the breakdown and the dollar amounts uh, by category of education, health, transportation, and so on. 
If we click on the individual slices of the investment pie, we learn that of these investments, 117.9 million are targeted toward protecting educational achievement this year. That is the largest piece of the recovery dollars uh, that are going to Prince George's County. We're very proud in Maryland to have the number one school system in America, according to Education Week magazine. It's a top priority. It is our economic competitive strength, and we want to make sure that we protect the future of our kids in these troubled times. If you want more information on how we're investing education resources in Prince George's, again, you can click on the map. You see a breakdown whether what amount of this is Title I, what amount of special education, what amount of state adequacy and equ equity funding and other aid. Now let's move to the physical capital investments, those job creating rather than job saving investments. On the left, we can click to access, again, the more detailed map. Uh, if you look toward the top of the screen, we give citizens the option of putting their own address and zip code in Maryland. Uh, for the sake of this demonstration, we haven't inserted Congressman Van Hollen's address, but rather the Rockville Volunteer Fire Company at 380 Hungerford Drive, 20850. By clicking the Show Individual Projects on the Map button, you can see every Recovery and Reinvestment Act related project in proximity to this address highlighted on the map. Then we can click on, for example, this highway project. And as you can see from the information, again, posted on the map for all to see, it's a $1.7 million project on Maryland Route 28. We're expecting bids on July 16th, and we aim to have a contractor begin work in September. And again, all of that information is on the map. We're also mapping our water quality and drinking water upgrade projects. You can see this is a WSSC project in Prince George's County. We can also click on the weatherization data to see how many units each county is expected uh, to, uh, expects to weatherize. Prior to the Recovery and Reinvestment Act, we were weatherizing approximately 400 houses a year. With these important investment dollars, we've set a goal of 3,000 houses in 18 months. The website allows citizens to track our progress, again, in their own county uh, and uh, statewide. And through state stat, we're looking at the same data to ensure that we're meeting our goals and to hold relevant agencies accountable for changing course if necessary. Only two more slides, Mr. Chairman. State stat also updates the map on a weekly basis to reflect the fast pace of the implementation of our transportation projects. On transportation, if you will, and zoom in, for level of specific specificity available, that allows, citizen, allows any citizen to easily view things such as who has been awarded the contract for specific transportation projects, also the bid and award date of these projects, the amount, also the degree of minority business participation as part of this contract. As I mentioned, for every awarded contract, we're also tracking that minority business enterprise participation. And once the contract is awarded, we're able to show the level of minority business participation. And Congressman Cummings has been a, a national leader in these efforts, and we appreciate his leadership and partnership. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, there are, these are just a few examples. But all of the information is available. Most of these programs are already in existence. Uh, we've made all of this available to see on a recovery website, broadly sharing information instead of hoarding it, providing for maximum degree of openness and maximum transparency giving our public the tools that they need to monitor the progress of their own government. To those who are rightfully concerned about the integrity of these Recovery and Reinvestment Act dollars, we agree with the words of the great Louis Brandeis who said that sunlight is the best of disinfectants. And by measuring performance, by promoting openness and transparency, by using tools like mapping and the Internet, we believe that our efforts can go a long way in conjunction with other states towards guarding against waste, fraud, or abuse. And perhaps more importantly, Strengthening the connections between citizens and their government and the results that all of us want to see from these Recovery and Reinvestment Act dollars, namely an economy that's expanding, an American con economy that's creating more opportunity and more jobs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Governor O'Malley. I'd like, like to ask unanimous consent that the uh, Congressman Dent from Pennsylvania be allowed to sit and Congressman Robert Brady of Pennsylvania to sit. They're not on the committee, but be allowed to sit. And then I would like to yield at this time for Congressman Brady to introduce the governor of Pennsylvania, Governor Rendell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and also thank the ranking member and the members of the committee for allowing me to participate. It's my honor to introduce to you my governor, our governor, in the state of Pennsylvania. And when they first passed the stimulus package and we heard that it wasn't going through congressional districts, there was a little bit of concern out there with all of us. But when I heard it was going through the state, through our uh, executive director, our, our executive uh, officeholder or governor through the state of Pennsylvania. I was really relieved because I've known the governor for 
eight years as a district attorney, eight years as our mayor, and now six years as our governor. And he's extremely fair. Uh, he, he's extremely knowledgeable. He's uh, doing the right things with the money, putting them in the right places where it needs to be. He's venting them out uh, transparently for every, throughout the whole state. And, uh, and I do appreciate it, and I do appreciate what he does. And we are, our funding and money that we do get into the state of Pennsylvania is going to the, to the best use possible. Also, it's not, and I do appreciate you letting me sit up here because uh, it may help him to take another little look at the first congressional district in the <laughs> state of Pennsylvania to be a little more helpful than he has been, but I do appreciate his help. It's, again, my honor, my pleasure to introduce to you our governor, Governor. I think, he was, I think he was introducing and lobbying at the same time. Yeah, Governor. It's an honor to be here, Chairman Downs, and of course, Congressman Brady is, to me, my chairman, because as you all know, he's been chairman of the Philadelphia Democratic Party for uh, a long time, almost all the time I've been an elected official, and he will always be Chairman Brady to me. Uh, let me begin by thanking you for the opportunity to come down here, and I know Governor O'Malley and I welcome questions, so I'll try to be brief. Let me also point out that the state of Pennsylvania in this time of fiscal challenge to all of us is much more fiscally conservative than the state of Maryland. I don't have a fancy PowerPoint to demonstrate to you what we're doing, but I do have attached to my testimony a one-page printout of what our website looks like. This is a, a contract for a, a, a road resurfacing. It shows you exactly what the citizen can find out about it. And the citizen can find out just about everything. Start date, projected completion date, how many jobs it's creating, who were the major contractors uh, that got the awards and how much money each contractor is getting, uh, what the goal of the, of the project is in terms of uh, road resurfacing or, or, or bridge rehabilitation. Um, and we are committed, and I'll talk very briefly in a minute about our uh, oversight, our transparency, and our fiscal responsibility. But I do want to say one thing, because I had a chance to listen to the, on TV to the prior panel, and I want to say one thing about the stimulus. And I had a chance, Congressman and I had a chance to discuss a little bit about this idea that the stimulus isn't moving as fast as it could. Um, governors, and Governor O'Malley and Governor Patrick will remember that, we met with uh, President-elect Obama in Philadelphia in very early December. And the purpose of our meeting was to ask uh, the President for help in uh, three ways. One, to help our citizens who were in need and struggling with the stimulus. Two to help states that were just uh, because of the, down, uh, the, the downturn in revenue were up against it, and three, to create jobs through infrastructure. Uh, the stimulus program, I think, took great steps to achieve all three goals. Pennsylvania gets $9.9 .9 billion of stimulus money through formulas for Medicaid, for infrastructure, for energy, for education, 9.9. .9. Our citizens get about $8 billion dollars directly from the stimulus. And our citizens, 3.7 million Pennsylvanians are enjoying the, uh, the uh, uh, tax cut that has uh, 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 already appeared in their paychecks. Almost a million Pennsylvanians are enjoying the additional money in the uh, uh, SNAP program, in uh, uh, food, uh, food, what we used to be referred to as food stamps. Uh, over 100,000 Pennsylvanians are getting extended and increased workman's comp uh, unemployment compensation benefits. So the point of giving direct aid to the citizens, that sometimes is overlooked when we talk about stimulus. It's not what's written up, it's not a question of oversight because that money goes directly to citizens, but Pennsylvania citizens are infinitely better off because of the stimulus, and a lot of that money, like the $32 increase in, in, in uh, food stamps a month, that has pumped a significant amount of money into the economy. And food stamps get spent. They get spent immediately. And they get spent at usually corner grocery stores, and it goes all the way through the distribution chain, that type of spending. So number one, I think the stimulus has achieved its goal early on in helping individual citizens, and I'm sure the same thing is true in Maryland and Massachusetts. Number two, providing essential aid to the states. 30 of our states have raised taxes this year. Almost all of our states have made significant cuts in services. The increase in taxes, the cuts in services, would be infinitely greater were it not for the aid that the stimulus program has given to the states. Without 
the money that we receive in this coming fiscal year, we'll receive close to $2 billion in stimulus aid that helps us defray costs in our budget. Without that, there would be thousands of additional layoffs, not just of state workers, state police, uh, case workers in, in our system, but teachers, local law enforcement officers, uh, municipal and county workers and employees, all across the state, we would have seen thousands upon thousands of additional layoffs. And when you do this computation, and I know it's very difficult to put your finger on it, how many jobs the stimulus retained, uh, how many jobs it created, well, I can tell you, because of the direct aid to states, it helped retain an awful high number of government jobs. And that not only, not only helps job retention, but it helps keep those people out there serving the people in need at a time when obviously need is increased because of the economic recession. The third goal of the stimulus was to jumpstart ready-to-go projects. And I think most of us have done it right. Most of us took the transportation money, working with our regional planning organizations, and did fix it first. Why did we do fix it first? Because if you're fixing a bridge, you don't have to do an environmental assessment, you don't have to do an environmental impact statement, uh, you've got the right of way acquired, and you can get to work on that bridge in less than four months, and in Maryland's case, even faster. So we did fix it first, and we're spending the money. Pennsylvania originally had 242 projects. By the way, the good news is, because construction costs are lower than anticipated, 17 percent lower in Pennsylvania, we're going to be able to add more projects to the uh, ARRA list. But we have 100, work has begun on 131 of our 242 bridge and road projects in less than four months. We had an expedited bidding system. We gave contractors 60-day limit when they could begin work, and things are happening. I told the story, I was in uh, Beaver County, uh, a distressed county north of Pittsburgh, and we were embarking on an $11, billion, $11 million project to repair a bridge that went from the city of Beaver into the city of Rochester. 38 workers and five vendors, the contractor and four vendors, all Pennsylvania companies, steel, asphalt, timber, concrete, um, all Pennsylvania companies, all of whom bring back people into their factories as they get new contracts. If you look at the job loss in Pennsylvania, and we're a little bit better than most states, our unemployment rate is a point and a quarter below the national average, but if you look at the job loss in Pennsylvania, the two big sectors, construction and manufacturing. What infrastructure stimulus does, construction and manufacturing. It's working. And the good news is it's only going to get better. Most of our projects are going to be roll out and kick into high gear the rest of July, August, September, October, November. You're going to see a huge impact. So I think the stimulus is going to work. I think any judgment on it is premature. And I think we should all not make this a partisan issue. We should all take a deep breath and let's see how it works. Uh, I personally think we should have more infrastructure. So I would like to see a second stimulus devoted solely to infrastructure. It's the one that produces jobs and produces orders for factories, American factories. But I also agree that let's see how this rolls out. Let's see how this rolls out before we make a decision on anything else. But uh, I think it's going to be successful, and I think it is working, and I urge everyone to be patient. Lastly, controls. We're much like Governor O'Malley, and Governor O'Malley has done a fine job in uh, controls. Our transparency is just that. We even take input before we issue RFPs, uh, like on weatherization, for example. Uh, Pennsylvania spends $30 million a year on weatherization. Most of that is federal. We're now in receipt of $253 million of weatherization funds, 30,000 homes. We don't have, initially, we didn't have a clue how to ramp up because most of the $30 million is done through nonprofits. So we went online and got suggestions from people and providers and the nonprofit community themselves. And we had discourse online. It's really exciting uh, to, 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 see, to see the discourse. Uh, we have oversight. Uh, we hired a, a CEO, of a retired CEO of a company, a real tough former West Pointer. He is our accountability officer, and he has wide sweeping powers. We put together an oversight committee, as Congressman Brady knows. Um, the two senators were allowed to put one person on the committee. The Republican House Caucus put one person on the committee. The Democratic House Caucus put one person on the committee. Same thing with the 
four caucuses in Harrisburg. So we have eight members that came from, from Republican and Democratic uh, members of uh, various legislatures. Then we have the head of the Chamber of Commerce, the head of United Way, and the head of the AFL-CAO, and that's our 11-member oversight panel. In terms of fiscal controls, well, Pennsylvania every year, state and federal and other fund money, we spend about $61 billion. And we're fortunate that we have all sorts of controls, pre-audits, post-audits by the Auditor General. We have controllers in every department. We've got a very, very good sound system. But we didn't rely on just our system and just the federal controls. We work with the GAO, and the GAO has been tough. I don't know if Governor O'Malley would agree with that, but the GAO holds us to a very tough standard. They wanted us to do risk assessment. We have 90 different stimulus projects. We did a risk assessment with the GAO and came up with 15 of the ones that are the highest risks, including, for example, the weatherization project. And GAO, GAO in its report says, Pennsylvania has taken steps to track recovery funds and assess risks. Uh, so we've gotten high marks. We're going to continue to get high marks because it's important to us. The Congress and the administration took a leap of faith with stimulus. And we know as governors that a lot of the implementation is on our hands. And ladies and gentlemen of the Congress, we don't intend to let you down. Thank you very much, um, uh, Governor. Uh, yield uh, five minutes to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Turney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Governors, thank you uh, for your testimony on that. I have a couple of questions. One is with the weatherization. Uh, a lot of that money is, is yet to be implemented. I think, Governor Rendell, you, you, you mentioned that the infrastructure is a bit of an issue. Could each of you tell us what you're doing to make sure that, uh, that we have that infrastructure ramped up? I know we have monies in the Green Jobs Act, uh, which could train people for that, as well as other resources, and then what uh, structures you're going to use to actually get it done, and when do you think, in your respective states, that money will start to show an impact in terms of hiring people and getting the work done. Um, Governor Rendell, if I could ask you to start. Well, sure. Um, it's, it's, as I said, it's, a, it's one of our biggest challenges because our infrastructure spends $30 million a year. All of a sudden, we have $253 million to spend in 18 months. Um, our infrastructure on the $30 million is that we go through nonprofit organizations in different regions, and they pick the contractors. We're not certain, I mean, we are actually certain that the current infrastructure cannot deal with $253 million. So we're in the process of, as taking input from these groups, we're in the process of trying to build an infrastructure that can do this. And it may mean getting some private firms involved in doing the weatherization. So we've been talking to a lot of the ESCOs, the companies that do energy controls on buildings and whatever, and we have ESCOs working on every public building in, in the Commonwealth. We're looking at the ESCOs and seeing if we can talk them into uh, whether it's financially remunerative enough for them to do some of the work. Uh, we've hired two people uh, with experience in this to, to help us flesh out our weatherization program. But it is a difficult program. Uh, but I just want to give you a quote. In my testimony, I quoted a weatherization leader from Lycoming County, nonprofit, who says, in my opinion, this really is a good way to make stimulus dollars work. There'll be job creation, subcontracting, and materials purchase. But the beauty of it, too, is we'll be helping a lot of people reduce their energy costs. So I think the weatherization program is a great program. Once we can gear it up, I think you'll see a tremendous amount of job creation and, again, tremendous amount of... Uh, uh, of subcontracting and material purchase. No, I agree with your last point wholly. That's why I asked the question. Governor O'Malley. We began our first weather, we commenced uh, work on our first weatherization project approximately two weeks ago at a home of a very nice family in Montgomery County. And what we have found is that the capacity for accommodating the weatherization work was better in some counties than in other counties. Mm -hmm. and. Um, so we're, we've created uh, partnerships much like the ones Governor Rendell talked about. We found that our community colleges are also tremendous sources for us in terms of providing the training, and the companies themselves are, are, are helpful in that as well. It has been a bit of a ramp up. Some of our counties are partnering with neighboring counties in order to get them up to, to steam. But we've already begun that work, and we anticipate that we're going to be able to fill the, uh, the demand and, and get it done in a timely fashion. And to add to what Governor O'Malley said, it's a great program for taking displaced workers, cabinet makers whose factory closed because they made cabinets for homes, for new homes, 
taking them and giving them not jobs that necessarily are going to pay at the income level they were getting before, but jobs that will get them an income flow again. And we're spending, the stimulus gave us almost uh, $700,000 uh, uh, to do uh, uh, jo job, 700, excuse me, million dollars to do job retraining. And we have a lot of retraining programs through the Department of Labor for the weatherization program. Because 30,000 homes, you can imagine, in 18 months, it's very labor intensive. Well, thank you. Um, I know a lot of, of, of members here are having some discussion about whether or not the jobs are being created fast enough, but I, I note that our uh, minority leader, John Boehner, was quoted uh, on the 15th of June as saying he's pleased that the federal officials stepped in in order for Ohio to use all of its construction dollars for shovel-ready projects that will create much-needed jobs. Uh, and I think that's what most people expect, that this will happen on that. Uh, do you agree with uh, Mr. Boehner that you know, once we get this money out of the federal agencies and to the states, uh, that in fact we should see some jobs created in, in both your states? At every level. I mean, the transportation money, again, Maryland was ahead of a lot of us, but you're going to see in Pennsylvania, July, August, September, October, November, tremendous amount of construction work. I mean, a tremendous amount of construction work. Do you agree, work. Governor O'Malley? Yes, Congressman, I do. We, we anticipate some 17,000 jobs being created in the course of the life of the stimulus on transportation, supported uh, because of these transportation dollars, not to mention the water and the wastewater projects. And they yeah. will have a ramp-up trajectory. Is there any doubt in either of your minds that the money from the Recovery and Reinvestment Act given to states so far has at least uh, stopped or, or enabled you not to uh, lay off additional people. I know it's been tough on everybody's state and some people have been laid off, but what would be the situation in your state in terms of people losing their job and, and things not happening, services for citizens, if the arrow monies had not been out there? Well, I hesitate to think. I can tell you that there were 700 jobs that were about to be eliminated within our state government on, on, uh, on the eve of the passage of the uh, Recovery and Reinvestment Act. So that's 700 right off the top. But the ripple effect of that, the cascading effect of that, if we had to close $2 billion, $3 billion holes in our budget in the current year, that would have affected all of our school districts. There would have been teachers being laid off. There would have been other layoffs at the local level as well. We would have exacerbated what is already a very daunting and challenging uh, problem. So there's not a doubt in my mind that these dollars have actually uh, been very, very effective in keeping this unemployment rate from being worse than it otherwise would be. And, and I agree, and I related that in my earlier testimony. But I also think it is creating new jobs. The 38 jobs on that bridge in, in, in Beaver County that I talked about, every one of them were building trades, men and women, who hadn't worked in six months. Hadn't worked in six months. The vendors told me that they were bringing back people that they had previously laid off. We had a big ceremony. So we're actually, in addition to retaining, we're creating new jobs. And I also want to say that I think most states, and I know Maryland's doing this, we're not using this stimulus money as a, as a uh, uh, supplanting money we've been spending before. For example, and Congressman Brady knows this, uh, Pennsylvania is engaged in its own accelerated bridge program. I got the uh, legislature to commit uh, an additional $350 million last fiscal year to do bridge work. All told, Pennsylvania's, there's $1 billion of road resurfacing and bridge in ARRA. All told, Pennsylvania's spending, sp spending $3 billion on this. So we're trying to add to the stimulus program with our own stimulus. And I think that's true in a lot of states. Thank you, Thank, you, Mr. Chairman. thank you very much. I now yield five minutes to Mr. Chaffet of Utah. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Governors, both uh, for being here. Appreciate your service and your commitment to our country and your states. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to ask you a, a few questions, um, uh, Governor Rendell. How many jobs have been created in Pennsylvania with the stimulus? Mm, well, so far, uh, of the seventeen billion dollars that's coming into Pennsylvania, about one billion has been spent. Now, when I told you that 131 of our 242 projects are underway, right. you know, we pay as you go. You know, we reimburse for work done by the contractors. So that number is going to ramp up very, very, very fast. Uh, I, I would say on creation of jobs, probably a couple of thousand at this point. Uh, on retention of jobs, probably five to 10,000. But is there any metric? I mean, I guess one of the things we struggle with is everybody estimating and guessing. I mean, the real number that we look at is the unemployment rate, and it's skyrocketed. 
Well, it has uh, not achieved nearly what it's supposed for us, to. though, our unemployment rate is about a point and a quarter below the national average. Still horrible, right. you know, horrific, but a point and a quarter below the national average. I think stimulus has helped us to some degree. And again, the state stimulus adding to the federal stimulus, I think, has been very effective for us. Uh, whereas we're just starting work on the bridges and roads with the federal stimulus, our accelerated bridge program, we had targeted 470 bridges and we're working on 420 of them now. So that, that's had an effect. It, it's difficult to understand, and I know each of us want definitiveness. Well, the, the problem is, when you say a billion dollars and talk about 2,000 jobs, and yet we hear from the testimony from the, the Office of Management and Budget that one of the most important things you can do is get people back, money back in the people's pockets. Well, there's no question. That we're going to create 70 percent of the jobs created in this country are created from small businesses. N no and question. Yet, when I hear Governor O'Malley talk about 700 jobs, those are 700 government jobs. No, no. But, but first, first and foremost, the retention of jobs initially, the, the biggest... Uh, um, I mean, you, it, pardon me, Governor. I, my sure, my time okay. is so short. I, I, I know I'm interrupting you with all Don't due respect. Your numbers directly coincide from what we heard from the Office of Management and Budget. The federal government has spent some $75 billion and yet can only point to 150,000 jobs. We're talking about a half million dollars if I'm doing the math I correct. think I can explain that. And your numbers are somewhat similar to that, right. which is very revealing. I think I can explain that, though, Congressman. A lot of that billion dollars has gone to individuals. It's gone to the worker who lost his job and is getting unemployment comp. He's now getting more But that's not creating money. jobs. I mean, no, no, I, I understand. But what I'm saying is, remember, the stimulus had a, a number of different goals. And I hope everyone in Congress... My understanding it was jobs, jobs, jobs. It, right. it, it, it was, but it was also relief for people in need. So would you consider giving an unemployed worker longer period of unemployment compensation and a higher stipend, that's not going to create, uh, maybe he'll have more money to spend. I agree that. with you. But do you think that was an appropriate thing to do under stimulus? Uh, like when you go out and you spend of billions of dollars, there are going to be jobs created and there's going to be relief given to people. Right. I, I understand and that. And relief was part what of it. I understand, but I and guess where conceptually demand. I disagree with is the idea and the notion that where government is creating jobs. They're creating government jobs. The perspective I have is let's, give the pe let's empower people. And one of the things that I wanted to ask you, and I'll, Governor, I'll give you a chance sure, to. Sure, that's okay. Uh, it, it, that we heard in earlier testimony is that 28 states have raised taxes, which you say, quote, deepens the impact of the downturn. And is that your perspective as well? If you raise taxes within the state, would that, quote, deepen the it, it impact of the downturn? It the, depends on the scope of the increase, number one. But number two, Without the stimulus, those 28 states would have had to raise taxes infinitely greater. I mean, do you under, you've got to understand that. Right now, I, this year that concluded, Pennsylvania's revenues... I guess the question is who should pay for it. And I, I want to give Governor O'Malley a chance here, okay, too. Can, but but can I, uh, that's, where, that's what's offensive, to, I think, to a lot of people, is that states that weren't thing, managed though, as well have to end up paying the tab for... You know, states like Utah, we balance our budget. We don't have that. We, we had a 400-plus... A uh, million dollar rainy day fund. We didn't even have to tap sure. into that. And we cut expenses. I, I would submit to you that if you looked at the demographic of Utah, it's totally different than the demographic of Pennsylvania and Maryland when it comes to people living below the poverty line, the number of disabled people, the number of special ed students. You can't compare apples to oranges. But, but the one thing that, that I wanted to s say is look, I think the stimulus bill was misnamed. Part of it was stimulus, part of it was job creation, but a lot of it was relief relief and uh, I, part I'm of the semantics i guess I'm just, that we're struggling with is what it, the jobs are but that's why i would like to see again if and i know my guess is you're not very in favor of an additional stimulus but if you do it just do infrastructure i guarantee you you can come to any one of my infrastructure 3.5 percent of the stimulus was infrastructure as i understand it roads and bridges not, I, I mean that's a little that's higher the than that, but but look, scam! Wow, you know, do like, come on, what's, infrastructure because is, I can bring you to every infrastructure project we've got going, and you will see people working who weren't working before. You'll see Pennsylvania factories getting orders that didn't have orders before, and that's what it's all about. And they work for private companies. And they work for private companies. They don't work for us. Yeah. Gentlemen's time has long expired. Thank you know, you, Mr. But, Chairman. Mr. Chairman, when, when uh, the governor was saying jobs, 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 give us public works jobs, road jobs, it was just too good to cut off, wasn't it? Yeah, I must admit that that was. Uh, but the point is that uh, I think that the gentleman um, um, needs to understand, though, that um, 
when you look at the whole situation in terms of job creation, you cannot look past retention. I think about the 14,000 teaching jobs that were saved in New York City as a result of the stimulus package, which means that that affects our educational system because if they had been laid off, then the classrooms in terms of the amount of students there would have been much larger, learning would have probably, the process would have slowed down, and all these kind of things would, uh, anyway, let me yield to the gentleman from, the gentleman from Virginia. By the way, of Massachusetts. <laughs> I thank the chairman. And I would ask uh, without objection that my opening statement be entered into the record. That objection. Um, so, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, it's uh, fascinating to, to me to hear uh, my friends on the other side of the aisle express so much concern about jobs, since every one of them voted against this recovery package. And had, in fact, their view prevailed, there'd be zero jobs. Zero. Um, and in fact, it was because of their import tunings, there was less infrastructure investment, exactly. Governor Randell. That's Isn't true. that true? Oh, there was a, a movement in the House to uh, d dramatically raise the infrastructure investment, and it got voted down. Precisely. The AMT may be a good thing to do, but it was because of three members of the other side of the aisle in the other body who insisted that had to replace infrastructure money, that that went in the stimulus bill. That's correct. But having said that, one of the things that concerns me is we've seen some linear thinking uh, in, in, in this hearing today that literally takes the amount of money and divides it by the amount of jobs and then says that's what it costs per job. Is that how it works? That, for example, when you build, uh, Governor O'Malley, a metro system such as we have here in, in, the, in the nation's capital, the only benefit from that investment was the actual number of jobs created at the time of construction. Isn't that true? No, there would be a cascading benefit because of the demand created within the economy for all sorts of things. Right. And so there's been a return on that investment? There's a return that's much greater than the initial investment, which is why in the past this great country always made big investments like that. So, for example, Governor Rendell, when Dwight Eisenhower, a Republican president, Absolutely. had the vision to make an investment in the interstate highway system, which today I think probably would have been opposed by some of my friends on the other side of the aisle. And by the way, that water was carried by none other than a senator from Connecticut named Prescott Bush. That interstate highway system created 50 years ago had a drop dead cost to it, but 50 years later has it had other positive benefits well, since the construction? Sure, economic competitiveness, quality of life, public safety, but it was also a great jobs and orders for American factory bill as well. Look, Congressman, uh, if we're really concerned about jobs, I have a suggestion. Change the way you score the federal budget. And it's not just my suggestion. My, the organization I had, Building America's Future, had Speaker Gingrich and, and, and former leader Gephardt together. And they both say, let's change the way we score the federal budget. Go on, offline, do a capital budget like every other political entity in this country has put a trillion dollars into an infrastructure repair program, let's get it done in the next five years, and you will see this economy humming. Not just construction jobs, but steel plants. Good, good point, Governor Rendell, but I guess I want to still return to the point that you and Governor O'Malley have clarified for us, that you can't just count the exact jobs created by Activity X today. You've actually got to look at whether it's an investment that has a return on it, or is it just a sunk cost that has no other you positive would have to ramifications? To clock the number, number of jobs. You do the jobs on the construction site, then go back to every vendor, interview the CEO, and find out how many people he brought back or how many new people he hired. That's the only way to accurately do it. But then when you look at the lasting nature of the infrastructure, we also have future generations that benefit from the upgrades to the, the roads, the bridges, and also the water and infrastructure and its impact on the environment. Enhances mobility, transshipment, movement of goods and services, Absolutely. helps the economy in ag creating aggregate demand. Is that true? That's true. So we can't just look at it in a linear way. I also heard earlier this morning from our friends on the other side, the, the idea, actually the idea that wouldn't have tax cuts been better than direct spending. Hmm. Did we not try tax cuts like the hmm. largest tax cut in history in 2001 in this economy, Governor Rendell? We did. And, and Governor Rendell, what was the net effect of job creation from those historic tax cuts in 2001 by 2009? We actually lost jobs in the country and not all to blame on 
uh, the tax cuts, but tax cuts clearly by themselves don't work. To Do you know jobs. how many jobs have been lost, as a matter of fact, in that recession that began in 2007, not Several in million. January of 2009? Several million. Six and a half million yeah. jobs lost. But so we've tried that. Is that true? Agreed. And, and remember, to, just to be fair, uh, it was President Obama who suggested the $800 uh, a family tax cut, which I believe went to pay off bills, which was a good thing from the family standpoint, didn't create any jobs. I, I would love to have seen some of that tax cut money traded for infrastructure, because we know infrastructure creates jobs. There's no doubt about it. There's no quarrel. There's no debate. And by the way, infrastructure is not a Republican or Democratic issue. I testified before um, a Senate committee and Senator Inhofe, uh, one of, I guess, conceded to be one of the more conservative members of, of the Senate, said that uh, uh, aside from uh, keeping the peace, he thinks building the infrastructure is the second most important thing we can do as a nation. And we ought to get to it. And I, might get add, and I might add that President Obama also had to labor under the burden that any chief executive of a republic does of fashioning a consensus to get his package through Congress and to have done nothing was certainly, um, I don't think is an option that anybody in, in these halls would, would say was available to him. I thank the chairman. Thank you. I yield 30 seconds to the ranking member, and then at that point I'll yield five minutes to Mr. Dent, who has been uh, given unanimous consent to be able to participate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll use just a small part of it to recognize the senior Senator Gore for his contribution in that uh, superhighway system under Eisenhower. Mr. Chairman, uh, pursuant to uh, Rule 6, Clause 2, I request uh, to call witnesses selected by the minority on one day of hearing uh, concerning the tracking of Federal Recovery Act dollars funding uh, and uh, uh, we request the hearing take place before the summer district work period at a mutually agreeable date. Uh, and, uh, Mr. Chairman, briefly, uh, the only reason for this, uh, as we discussed, is that we weren't able to have a third panel. That th panel was dismissed, and it was uh, found to be uh, inappropriate to put them on either of the first two panels. So we, we do not have a witness, but we, we believe that it will be productive to have uh, witnesses at a future time to be decided. And I thank the Chairman. Congressman Diff in Pennsylvania. Thanks, Chairman, and uh, thank you, Governors, both for being here, and uh, especially Governor Rendell, given I know it's, I was a member of the General Assembly, and at a time like this, I'm really glad <laughs> I'm not. And uh, I know you are all going through a torturous process, and uh, so delighted that you could be here with us. Uh, one thing on the stimulus. It seems that much of the funding is being used to fill holes, budget holes, potholes. And uh, one thing I've noticed, too, that you're a great advocate for infrastructure, as am I. A lot of us are. But one of the frustrations, this is not a criticism of you or PennDOT. It's just the statement of reality that, according to what I'm reading from uh, PennDOT, uh, there's $307 million of commitments for roads, bridges, highway projects, and we've spent up to this point about $9.3 million. No. That's, this came from the Commonwealth. It's a di difference between spending and obligated. Oh, I know. This is, this is what's spent, not obligated. Right, That's what because, I'm to, yeah. again, yeah. it's less than four months, and most of the projects, that 131 I've talked about, are just starting up, and it's PennDOT's pay as you go. Uh, understood, and I just want to be clear that you're not able to do a whole lot of new capacity construction with this money because of the federal rules. You get a dollar. You're you're mostly doing resurfacings and bridge repairs. Well, because we wanted to do it fast and make an right. impact. That's and correct. Create not, jobs. It's not a criticism. And it's we just built a, a new road. We'd have had to do right away an, yeah. an environmental assessment. Correct or environmental impact statement, it would have been two years but, before we'd have a shovel in the that, ground. That's right. I mean, the process, the federal process, is what prevents you from spending money on new capacity. I mean, I think we agree on that point. But I guess that's the point I'm making. It seems that much of the stimulus money in Pennsylvania, and I suspect around the rest of the country, is being used for basic services, Medicaid, Title I, uh, IDEA. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's an issue that we are all confronting here. It's going to basic services uh, relief as opposed to jobs, I guess we can make it, we can have this argument about relief versus jobs, but nevertheless, it's relief money. One other thing, too, in the GAO report, it says that the, uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Education officials expressed concerns about assessing jobs created and retained, that they are, and that they are telling districts uh, not to use the recovery funds to create new positions that will need to be sustained beyond the uh, uh, two-year period, uh, but instead to use the, uh, the funds for one-time costs, such as teacher retention bonuses and even some recruitment uh, issues. 
Um, so I guess really the question is, will the teachers who receive the so-called uh, retention bonuses be counted as jobs retained? And is there a way to quantify how many teachers would have left work without the recovery fund retention bonuses? I, I think the Department of Education could do that for you, but, but let me just amend what you said. Uh, the Department of Education and properly recommended to the school districts that on the stabilization money that they receive, not to do any new hires because you lose that money in two years and you'd have to, you know, obviously get rid of the people you hired. But they urged them to do it on things that had a legacy, like keeping teachers or teacher training or school modernization. I would have loved to have seen the stimulus allow uh, the, the, uh, uh, school construction, here, here. school construction, uh, and and uh, school rehabilitation, but somewhere along in this process, and I don't know who can. Who's on the Senate me. side? I, on I the get, Senate side, I, they knocked out, uh, I, and well, we can only use it for school modernization. Understood. That would have been the best use of these funds because they're two-year yeah, funds. Sure would. You don't want to put I, them in your operating I, budget. Understood, but that same fund of money that's used, being used for retention and recruitment, I'm not sure why we need to spend money for recruiting during a economic downturn like we're experiencing, but. But, you know, that's the same money that, I, that could be used for, a, say, a state-related institution like a Penn State Temple Pitt. And I know you have to make a lot of hard decisions, you and the General Assembly. Penn State's getting cut significantly. But, you know, instead of funds using, being used for retention or recruitment, could those not be used for, say, higher ed? Well, understand, or, yeah. the four state-related schools, Penn State, Pitt, Temple, et cetera, are getting stabilization money. The cuts that they're receiving would be much worse without the stimulus, much worse. The, uh, well, uh, I guess finally, the, uh, I have no further comments. I just appreciate the fact that you came here, but I think we all have to recognize that so much of this money is being used for uh, restoration of basic services, where most of it's been spent. I understand the frustration on the, uh, the infrastructure. I feel it too. Alan Beeler does a, a very good job for everybody in Pennsylvania, and uh, I've had these conversations with him many times about the uh, inability to sped, spend this federal money quickly uh, because of our rules. Uh, that constrain your ability to build new capacity. Right. Would the gentleman yield? I would be happy to yield. Uh, following up on the question I asked the Governor Patrick earlier, would both of you comment on uh, how you feel you should spend the money when you do spend it on public works projects? Should you be spending it at the lowest allowable wage under the Act? Uh, or would you support what has been reported and that Governor is going to confirm that Massachusetts is about $17 above the federal prevailing wage as such, they're getting less bang for their buck. Would you both comment on how you feel that should be done in your states? Well, I would say very succinctly, we follow the federal rules. So the money that's being spent is being spent at a wage rate similar to the money we get from iced tea. Uh, there's no difference. And in Pennsylvania, it's interesting, we have regional uh, assessments of what the prevailing wage is. So the prevailing wage in Philadelphia for a uh, sheet metal worker is significantly higher than the prevailing wage in Altoona. And so Altoona Road projects get paid at their prevailing wage, Philadelphia at their prevailing wage. But it's the same as the money that you give us that's joined with state money every year. And that should stay that way. And I believe that's the same way that we do it. Thank you both. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, would, would, would you yield me just 10 seconds? I, I will yield you 10 seconds, yes. To, to Mr. Ice's point, but irrespective of the prevailing wages, is it not true that the cost of construction has come down so much right. that, as a matter of fact, these dollars are creating yeah. more jobs and allowing for more construction because yeah, of we're that? We're seeing very competitive bids coming in, uh, coming in much more competitively. In other words, a better bang for the buck for no our question. federal tax yeah, dollar. Our, our bids are coming in close to 17 percent lower than expected, which is going to uh, enable us to not only do 242 projects, we're going to take that extra money again, spread it through the regional planning organizations and do some and Mr. additional projects. And Mr. Chairman, may I point out that the people that are competing for these jobs, these are small business people. Yeah. These are people whose families have sometimes yeah. been putting their neck on the line, keeping food on the table. We all know that it's the private sector that creates these jobs, but when it comes to big things like our bridges, like our infrastructure, those are things that we can only do together. So these are real private sector jobs. I might also add that the safety net, the so-called filling of the gap for the budget, in this great recession, there is a much greater demand from hardworking people who, through no fault of their own, find themselves unemployed. And the being able 
to provide health care while they transition. Being able to allow them to go and put food on their table creates demand in the economy. And I might also add that the dollars invested in public education are most definitely saving teaching jobs. And teachers are Americans too. And they're part of this economy as well. Yeah. Uh, if I can just comment, the $32 increase in the food stamp program for Pennsylvania translates to, in a year, almost $600 million of more spending. Think about that. That's Thank how many people we have on food stamps. $600 million more spending, and it is the most direct and the most quick spending of all. Thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, yield myself um, uh, a few, five minutes. Uh, OMB's failure to issue timely guidance, in your opinion, if OMB has not provided states with the necessary guidance in a timely manner, is it possible to expect or is it feasible to, ex to expect states to report all required data by October the 10th? Is that possible? We, we, from our standpoint, Mr. Chairman, we um, I mean, certainly respect the hard work at OMB and, and the clearer they can be, the better. Uh, and at the same time, with regard to the dollars that we have already allocated and the dollars we're spending, we don't have a problem being able to report those in a timely manner in Maryland. We believe we can account for those and we can fulfill those reporting requirements. The difficulty comes in those uh, things that go directly to local education uh, boards or the things that go directly to municipalities. It creates a bigger challenge because we have to depend on uh, getting the feedback back from those municipalities and counties. So your efforts to force OMB to give us clear guidelines or to put the responsibility where the dollars are being spent, I think, is wise and, and proper. I agree. Another concern I have um, is that communities that desperately need Recovery Act funding are, in essence, being bypassed in many instances. Could you comment on this? I guess Governor Randell, as chairman of the National Governors Association, are you seeing this occurring in other states? Well, let me just refer to page three of my testimony where I talk about transportation funding. Uh, we've obligated $720 million of the $1 billion in federal funds we've gotten. And, Mr. Chairman, $315 million of that is obligated in what are federally classified economically distressed areas. So that's not quite half, but about 45 percent of our transportation dollars are being spent in economically distressed areas. We're trying, and I think we're doing a pretty good job on it. And Mr. Chairman, for our part, we map all of the dollars that we distribute. And I have no doubt that if we were not doing, distributing these dollars in an equitable way, I would certainly be hearing from the community leaders, from mayors and other people. So I think the map, the openness, the transparency, showing where the dollars land is critically important. Uh, and, and all of us need to be able to do that, as indeed Governor Rendell has done on, on so many of the things he mentioned, the tax cuts, the SNAP dollars, the extended unemployment benefits. Right. The Oversight Committee meets, yeah, meets twice a month, and they're given by the Chief Accountability Officer all of the materials that uh, have been done in the past uh, and all the decisions that are coming up. Now, they can't direct us to do anything per se, but we do listen to their advice and listen to their suggestions, and uh, uh, it's been a valuable process. One, we get some very valuable suggestions, but two, uh, it, it really because I'm from Philadelphia, I was the mayor of Philadelphia before I was governor, uh, Congressman Brady can tell you there's a belief out in the state that Philadelphia gets all the money. It's not true, but nothing I can do with this prove it. Since I've been governor, I've given Allegheny County, which is greater Pittsburgh area, about $800 million overall more than Philadelphia. No one in Allegheny County would believe that. So there was a th thought, and Congressman Dent can probably tell you this, that some of his colleagues that we were going to direct all of the money to the big cities uh, in democratic areas, et cetera. Um, and that's just not the case. First of all, so much of the money is driven by existing federal formulas. So f for our transportation dollars, every county in the state has transportation projects. And they made the decisions. They're involved in the regional planning organizations. They made the decision. The metropolitan Philadelphia area gets X dollars a percentage out of our federal dollars. 
they got the same percentage out of stimulus that they get every year. But people sort of had the feeling that we would direct these dollars in, in a political or in a geographically sensitive way. And having this sort of oversight is good. I mean, I like it, actually. I like it. You have uh, five minutes to the gentleman from uh, California, ranking member of Congressman Ice. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Chairman, and thank both of your governors for remaining. Uh, we're going to have votes in a few minutes, so you will get a thank, thankful relief when we leave for the votes, <laughs> I suspect. But I, I'd like to expand on a couple of things. Governor Rendell, I, I can't resist. The last time we were together, we were talking A-10 aircraft, if you recall. Uh, in light of the wind down of Iraq, in light of, if you will, the changing uh, external forces versus your National Guard and every governor's National Guard, do you believe this administration should begin right-sizing both the active duty and reserve components, including the Guard, to be lighter, quicker, perhaps less expensive to operate once you get past the highly trained personnel and start shedding themselves of legacy cost, which sadly would probably include tank killers for a battle we're not likely to have. Right. I, I believe the answer to that is yes, uh, uh, Congressman, but I, but I also think that that should have happened in the prior administration several years ago. I, I have no doubt it should have happened many administrations ago. Right. But uh, Governor, would you echo the same answer that, that this administration now inherits this need to right size to make both active and reserves more appropriate to the likely wars we're going to fight and make them lighter, quicker, and candidly perhaps provide you some further relief for the high tempo they've been in, in experiencing? Well, it's an interesting question because I think it, I mean, at the heart of the question is the constant need for military reform, not to allow ourselves to be lulled into fighting or paying or investing in fighting the last war. But I think that you'll never find it another time since 1814 when people have been more in danger here in the United States. So I think that there is a changing uh, mission for the Guard. Uh, but I, I, I don't know if that will necessarily be one that is less expensive. More likely, it'll probably be more exp expensive given the uh, vulnerabilities that um, uh, asymmetrical warfare poses to population centers, to ports, to critical infrastructure, telecommunications mode, cybersecurity, and the like. And w one quick addition. Yeah. We do need to replenish the Guard uh, in every state. We've lost equipment that hasn't been replaced. That was a constant refrain that governors, Republican and Democrats alike, had with the prior administration. We'd get our Guard units back, but with 40 percent of the equipment we sent over. Uh, and, and, Governor, that's the reason I asked the question for both of you. I'm not talking about going on the cheap, but many of you have legacy equipment, heavy tanks, no, uh, get rid of all kinds of equipment that, although if you replenish them, you're back where you started, isn't this an opportunity for the administration to go ground up and begin rebuilding the Guard, perhaps with different equipment, different missions, Absolutely. rather than ordering just replacements? I, I don't know if you're familiar, Congressman, with the Stryker Brigade. I know uh, Congressman Den is. The Stryker Brigade is a very, very mobile, quick uh, uh, unit. Yeah, I'm that very moves familiar. Fast. I visited them both in theater and in uh, the West Coast. And Pennsylvania it's exactly is what I'm talking right. about. Is wouldn't you prefer that yeah, over absolutely. M1 tanks? Yeah, and not only for foreign in, 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 encounters, but but for your home, domestic yeah. mission. No question. Okay, and because there is talk of a potential next round, but even if there isn't, this is still continuous. Let me ask one more question, which is unique to governors and not covered in the stimulus, but perhaps should have been, uh, besides infrastructure. One of the greatest burdens that you have uh, beyond uh, Medicaid and, and obviously your Medicare recipients is the unemployment burden. And both the last administration and this administration tried to address some of that growing unemployment with the federal extensions. But the other burden you have, which often is called Medicaid and some of the other programs, is that when people become unemployed, they lose their health care or they lose the ability to pay their COBRA is right. probably more often. Right. Do you believe that this committee or the Congress in general should begin looking separate from, we don't know whether we'll get comprehensive health care reform or not, but should we consider modernizing unemployment, or at least the federal match, to ensure that it, it, it anticipates 
paying for health care costs during the period of unemployment? Isn't that inherently the modernization of unemployment that has not been addressed? Yeah. yeah. I would say I mean, yes. I, I think we both agree, but, but uh, Congressman, if I could tell you anything other than uh, my constant refrain about infrastructure, I would tell you uh, we ought to find a way, and I think it should be done in a bipartisan fashion. We should find a way to do health care. The time has come for America to take care of its people like every other modern country in the world does. And if we found a way to do that, we wouldn't have to do it. You're absolutely right. In the absence of, an, of a bill, th that would be a great idea, great idea. But I, oh, I think we should get together and pass them. Th thank you, Governor. And, uh, you know, now that you're no longer mayor of Philadelphia, <laughs> perhaps the, the appropriate legend of your ability to get Philadelphia their fair share and then some will fade in time. <laughs> thank you. I don't have much time left. <laughs> Gentleman from Maryland. I'm going to be very brief, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I just, I'm glad to hear Mr. Issa talk about uh, health care and the unemployed um, because um, I'm going to hold him to that because we may get to a point where we have to do something like that um, because we've got to make sure that our people uh, are taken care of. This country is, I've said it many times, we get our authority in the world by moral authority. And how we treat each other, and um, but on that note, uh, Governor O'Malley, let me ask you: you, um, we, and both of you, before you all earlier in the testimony, there were a number of people who raised the issue that this is temporary help, and how do we hold the governors accountable after this, and how does and are we setting ourselves up for taking people up? and then a drop when stimulus money runs out. Now, you all may have answered that when I was out of the room, but I mean, where, where I mean, what, how do you look at that, uh, Governor? Yeah, Allen? it's an interesting question. It's one that's often asked of us uh, by citizens and, and small business owners of us. Uh, the fact of the matter is I think that we all hope, regardless of our differences in governing philosophy, we all hope that this recession will be of a temporary nature, right. and that's why this aid is of a temporary nature. But fortunately, it does span a two-year period of time. And uh, as I said in my earlier testimony, I think Governor Rendell echoed this, uh, the, the, the this recession and unemployment would be so much worse were it not for the investments that came from the Recovery and Reinvestment Act dollars. So we hope that with this greater demand created in the economy through a number of different vehicles, including these important investments, that we start c pulling our economy out of the ditch and where it's expanding and supporting jobs. And I might add, uh, while it's certainly nothing that we can call a trend, for the last month that we have complete data uh, in Maryland, we actually saw our state create 2,500 more jobs than we lost. Now, that was the first month that we had done that in a long time. Might be a blip, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, all hope and progress starts with the first steps. I, I agree with everything Governor O'Malley said, and particularly the last thing, because the answer to your question and the answer to the citizens' question, two years from now, two fiscal years from now, our stimulus money goes away. Mm -hmm. But Pennsylvania this year had negative 8 percent growth. Believe it or not, for the Mid-Atlantic, that was good. The average Mid-Atlantic state had negative 14 percent growth. I'm predicting in this up-and-coming budget, zero growth. For my first six years as governor, Congressman, I had between 5 and 6 percent growth. Every point of growth in Pennsylvania is worth $260 million. So let's assume by the year three, when stimulus drops off, we're back to 5.5 percent growth. 5.5% growth means I'll have a, it won't be me, but the governor will have another $1.4 billion to cushion the blow of losing those stimulus dollars. It's all about growth. That's why the economy, first and foremost, the economy is important to people who need jobs. Yeah. But secondly, it's important for us to be able to do all the things that we do as a government and some that we do very well and some not so well and we need to improve. But it's all about growth, and that's why it's so important to get that economy back. We'll, we'll take care of the stimulus gap if we have growth again. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Let me thank the gentleman from Maryland as well. And let me say, I thank um, the members, I thank the staff, I thank uh, the governors and all the witnesses that have participated today. I'm encouraged uh, that since the enactment of the Recovery Act, we have made some strides toward 
putting our economy back on track. But I am disappointed in the overall results so far. Unemployment is at a high and full force of stimulus spending has yet to be felt. Moreover, I remain concerned that with several issues related to the Recovery Act implementation. One issue that I intend to address immediately is the Department of Transportation's failure to define what qualifies as an economically distressed area for allocating Recovery Act funds. The point of this requirement is to direct stimulus spending to communities that need Recovery Act investments the most, like disadvantaged areas of my home district in Brooklyn. I will be sending a letter to the Secretary of Transportation, Ray LaHood, to explain my concerns and request a meeting with the Secretary to discuss this issue. Another problem that needs to be corrected is OMB's failure to issue all necessary guidelines. OMB's inconsistency in providing adequate and comprehensive guidance creates greater challenges for states to provide timely and reliable data by the October the 10th reporting deadline. This is another obstacle in terms of the majority of, of states that are already short staffed due to severe budgetary uh, cuts. In my home state of New York, state government agencies have been forced to function with a 10 percent reduction in their budgets for the fiscal year. The Office of the State Controller is particularly concerned that it will not be able to meet the escalating demands of auditing Recovery Act programs. The issue we discussed today are many of the same issues that we identified at our field hearing on the stimulus that led me to introduce H.R. 2182, the Enhanced Oversight of State and Local Economic Recovery Act. The House has passed this bill, and I hope we can continue moving forward until it is signed into law. We recognize that there are still important issues to be resolved before Recovery Act spending and accountability works as intended. Be assured that we intend to continue our detailed oversight of the programs until we finally see our recovery, the economic recover. Please let the record uh, demonstrate uh, by submission of a binder with documents relating to the hear this hearing without objections. I entered the binder into the uh, uh, committee stands, the committee's records, of course, and now the committee, the committee stands adjourned. And let me again thank the governors for coming and staying. I apologize to you for the way that we had to do this because of uh, there's a thing called votes around here, and that we have to make them, you know, and <laughs> not, they complain about not making them. So thank you, Governor Rendell. Uh, thank you, Governor O'Malley. And thanks for the opportunity. Definitely. Thank you for coming. The committee stands adjourned.